Welcome back to the factory this week, a lot of LEDs. We've assembled a three by three of the Globit matrix, the eight by eight matrix in a, a tiling pattern. And we also have another interesting tiling idea on the bake. We'll also cover a new motor driver. Let's do it. And first order of business today is to round out the Globit 8x8 matrix story. Here we have an assembled prototype, finally, of the 8x8 matrix, and it is just wonderful. Taking a look at the back, you can see we had no trouble soldering this bare wire onto those large pads that we were discussing in a previous episode. And I had my concerns about soldering to these pads and whether we would start dropping LEDs off the front, but without any like real care, these just went on super easily and not a problem with any components on the front falling off. So yeah, that's a win. We busted out the FLIR and ran this at full brightness and it is capable of getting pretty hot. On the back side, we measured around 60 degrees Celsius. And so that's probably at the upper limit of what you would want these dye temperatures to be running at. So you can definitely send them uh, pretty hot. But of course you can't be mad to drive these at full brightness anyway, because you can get so much out of them from you know like 20, 30, 50%. And what about the tiling? Well, I'm very pleased to say that we also ran a few boards through the pick and place machine and made this tile, this three by three tile, and it's got some weight in it. We put this together to test the tiling philosophy, whether the, the gaps were appropriate, whether the solder pads were about the right size. And I'm pleased to say that it was a resounding success. We were able to power this entire three by three matrix using just the two pads in the center. So power is being distributed out from the center through all of these edge connectors. With no wiring whatsoever, we were able to route the signal path from, this will be the top right for you, top right, snaking down through each tile in this like serpentine signal path with no trouble whatsoever, just soldering each D out to D in. And taking a look down the rows at the alignment, it was actually really easy to just align this on the bench face down without any special tools. We just placed them face down on a silicon mat and soldered the bridges together, and everything has lined up very nicely. It is possible to introduce a little bit of rotation with each tiling, but with due care, it's actually quite easy to get these bang on. In any case, the panels are submitted, panels and stencils are on the way. Can't wait to get these to you on our brand new production line. And a sneak peek at another tileable LED design. We're working on some tileable triangles at the moment, with the idea being that you could make some pretty nice abstract 2D artwork out of these. Here we've done, just done a little tiling test with four of them to make a larger triangle. And you know there may even be scope to do some 3D geometries as well. This is actually a little bit more of a tricky problem to solve because with just a three-sided object it's hard to close this 3D volume without having the pins lining up in the wrong spot, you know like shorting power to ground or a D out to another D out. So it's a little bit of a tricky problem that but we're having crack. Interesting problem to solve with this tiling design. You can see this lower left unit is where power and data come in. And so how do you tile something like this as a, as a linear address so that every LED falls in like a, a single dimension array rather than having the signal come into the central unit and then just simply fork to each of the other units, which would basically give you like a repeating pattern on those two units. How do you uniquely address all of these? And so we've included a loopback net. In the center of every tile is a loop pad, which is connected to every other loop pad. And that means that we can pass signal into this lower left one, go into the middle, and then it looks like we are going up to the top one through the, through the DO and DI connectors. And then we come back down through the loop connector and loop out to this last one in the bottom right. And so to then enable that loop connection, you just solder this jumper, which is the DI jumper. And that basically says, connect the DI pad to the loop pad. So even though geometrically, we have this fan out where you would probably expect you just have to have a repeated signal on these two units, we actually snake up and then back down so we can uniquely address every LED on this tile. But it's still early days for tileable triangles, but I think we're really onto something here. And I'm really excited to see what crazy shapes you can make out of these simple tiles. Maybe we'll have to introduce a rectangular tile to kind of pad out the system to give you a few more options. In any case, it's gonna be good. Moving on to more maker fundamental, maker essential gear. 
we did proto boards, we did real time clocks. What's next on the list? I think it's probably motor drivers. Motors make their way into so many projects and so we've put together this rather nice little two amp motor driver board. So this little chip is just a dual H bridge just like you're familiar with for driving say two DC motors bi-directionally or for driving a single stepper in any direction. This is a pretty nice chip. It's the TC78H660. But quite a nice feature is that it has a user programmable current limit. So as we'll ship these, it will have the current limit set to the maximum of about two amps. But with the inclusion of a potentiometer, you can BYO a 10K pot and set some other current limit to protect say really small motors or to set some kind of torque limit on your stepper motor. Even just to protect the rest of your circuit, having current limit built in is really nice. And so this has the standard control modes that you'd be used to with a dual H bridge, which is like the in one A, in one B, in two A, in two B, just so you've got a four pin control for two independent motors. But as we ship it, it will arrive in the direction and PWM mode, which is a little more beginner friendly, I think. It's a little easier to program around because you just set a direction and then some speed. We've actually made this footprint as compatible with as many potentiometers as we can. You can use these nice finger turn pots that will just fit on the triangular pads. The very cheap pressed metal ones, which need to use that pad that's all the way up there on its own. <laughs> and that's probably the one you'd use the most for this kind of thing, something that's very set and forget. But hey, if you really want to get precise with it, you can also fit one of these 10 turn or even 25 turn pots across that pad just like so. And so the way current limiting is set up with the potentiometer is that you just measure the voltage of a test point and the relationship is known. You get 1.1 amps per volt at that test point. So you just probe that point and turn your pot until you get say, I don't know, 0.5 volts. And then you know that you're going to get 0.55 amps current limiting. Just to give you a preview of the schematic design, here it is. We have our motor driver, of course, in the center, a bunch of you know, supporting capacitors, et cetera. But I think the interesting part is what happens on the V-Ref pin. This is where you set the current limiting. And if we follow that out, we've got a, a cap for some filtering. We come to our potentiometer. But the potentiometer is fed from the supply voltage, and that could be up to 18 volts. So you know, if you had, if you had a 18 volt supply running your motor, you would have such a small range on that potentiometer that was actually between say zero and two volts, which is the, the maximum current for this device. And so we need a voltage reference to set the maximum current allowable. And that's where this Zener diode comes in. Well, it is actually a voltage reference, but from VCC, which could be, you know, three to 18 volts, we go through a current limiting resistor and into our reference. And so now coming out of our reference, this is a stable, I think it's about 2.1 volts. Is that right? 2.5. 2.5 5 volts, fact checked. So we have 2.5 volts on this net, and now when our potentiometer goes in, we'll be able to use the full sweep of its, its angular resolution to go from zero to two amps. These other resistors are just here to pre-configure for the maximum current. What this also means is you don't necessarily have to put a potentiometer in here. You could put a single resistor between pins one and two, and then that would form a voltage divider between your fixed resistor and this 14K pot going to ground. A little bit of a advanced feature, but hey, if you know that you want an exact current and you don't want to dicker around with potentiometers, just bang a resistor in there. We've also got some reverse polarity protection by means of a P-channel MOSFET acting as an ideal diode. This is a pretty common way to do reverse polarity protection. You know, a lot of P-channel MOSFETs will drop a smaller voltage than say a Schottky diode, so you dissipate less heat. Of course, because our supply voltage could be quite high on this VDC input, we actually use the power indicator LED as a clamp so that the gate cannot be drawn too far below VCC. And that way we won't exceed the maximum VGS for this part. So there you have it, more tileable blinkies and a very flexible motor driver. Let me know what you'd like to make out of something like this or what should we should work on next in our like Maker Essentials series of hardware. Until next time, thanks for watching.